O Lord, I have heard of your renown, and I stand in awe, O Lord, of your work. In our own time, revive it. In our own time, make it known. In wrath, may you remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His, holy, his glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. The brightness was like the sun. Rays came forth from his hand, where his power lay hidden. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed close behind. He stopped and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The eternal mountains were shattered. Along his ancient pathways, the everlasting hills sank low. I saw the tents of Kushan under affliction. The tent curtains of the land of Midian trembled. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Or your anger against the rivers? Or your rage against the sea when you drove your horses, your chariots to victory? You brandished your naked bow, sated were the arrows at your command. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. A torrent of water swept by. The deep gave forth its voice. The sun raised high its hands. The moon stood still in its exalted place as the light of your arrows speeding by at the gleam of your flashing spear. In fury you trod the earth. In anger you trampled nations. You came forth to save your people to save your anointed. You crushed the head of the wicked house, laying it bare from foundation to roof. You pierced with his own arrows the head of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter us, gloating as if ready to devour the poor who were hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, churning the mighty waters. I hear and I tremble within my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones, and my steps tremble beneath me. I wait quietly for the day of calamity to come upon the people who attack us. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is found in Romans. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But all have not obeyed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Word of God, word of life. Dear hearers of the word of God, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is a difficult thing to be taught fear, and yet we must be taught it so that we can flee and run to the arms where we find peace and comfort. Remove all ungodliness from us, O God. By your wrath, remember your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been now two weeks, and this is our third week, as we look at Habakkuk. When I told one of my, one of my friends, who's a pastor, that I was going to be doing a, a small group or a, a sermon series on Habakkuk, he just he laughed profusely and said, that's what the church needs is more Habakkuk. Uh, and I hope you're finding that's the truth. Uh, it is a little bit of a, well, it's a minor prophet, so it doesn't get a lot of attention. And yet within these three chapters of the book of Habakkuk, we have some really powerful things, some really important things uh, that the prophet raises for us. We begin in chapter 3, the second verse this week, and we, we know this is a prayer of Habakkuk according to uh, uh, Shingoth. At least that's what the first verse says. And so the, 
the prophet begins in this way. And if you want to turn to your Bibles, I encourage you to do so. You can find this on page 763 in the Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you. The prophet begins his prayer. O Lord, I have heard of your renown. I have heard of your renown. There's no doubt in this then that the prophet knows a thing or two about this God that he proclaims, this God that has given him this message. And then he says, and I stand in awe. I know you, God. I know of the things you have done. I know of your renown and I stand in awe of it. Perhaps it would be a bit like meeting, I don't know, Brett Favre uh, or Tom Brady if you're a football fan or, uh, you know, whoever it might be that we lift up on, on, on pedestals a little bit and say, there is, the, there is perfection, right? You stand in awe of them. Celebrities or sports figures or politicians sometimes render us speechless as we just bask in their glory. I stand in awe, the prophet says. And we know from the beginning the relationship the prophet has with this God. And then he continues, in our own time, God, revive it. In our own time, make it known. From the first couple chapters, we know that things are not so good for the people of Israel, for the people to whom the prophet is speaking. Times are tough. So the prophet, as he prays to God, says, God, you are above all things. Your renown is beyond all things. Revive it amongst our people, God. Revive it in our time. Make it known now. And then we get to some key, to a key sentence. In wrath, may you remember mercy. In wrath, may you remember mercy. It's interesting here how the prophet holds these two things together, wrath and mercy. And how wrath precedes mercy. It's an interesting thing to be taught to fear. If any of you have ever had a child that is fearless, I have a cousin who has a little boy and there are stories of him riding his big wheel down a slide. And at every turn, they have to watch out for this little boy uh, because he is so fearless in his life. And so he does the wildest things. And my cousin, uh, God bless her, tries to protect him, tries to keep him safe as they try to, keep, try to teach him to fear. My own children, as we play outside in, in our front yard, it's like they don't understand that when, uh, when you get off the sidewalk or the boulevard, that's the road, and cars travel down the road, and sometimes they whip around, and it feels like they're going a million miles an hour, especially when my children are outside, and so we have to teach them to fear. You don't go out into the road. Stay on the sidewalk, stay in the driveway, stay in our yard, but you don't go out into the road, which they are more than happy to do, to go chase a ball or to go find a stick or to whatever it might be. And so we have to teach them to fear the road because of what can happen there, right? Their life could be taken from them because they have no fear of it. And so their, their mother and me have to be a little bit wrathful with them. Don't go out into the road or there will be consequences. There will be punishments. Because we cherish your life and we want you to be alive. And so we have to teach them fear and we do that through wrath. But there's a distinction that has to be made. You see, wrath is not retribution. We don't sit there from above just waiting for them to, to run out into the road so that we can punish them. 
We do it to teach them to not go out into a busy road, but to have a little fear of cars that travel down. So the prophet here holds these two things together. In wrath, may you remember mercy. Wrath is a hard thing. It's a hard thing to wrestle with with God. You see, God's wrath has actually fallen out of favor in in a lot of our culture today because it's such a difficult thing. And we want this God who is all love. And we read in Scripture, after all, that God is love. And so how how do we deal with that? How do we hold these things two together? Hold these two things together. Wrath and mercy. It helps to understand what God is doing. You see, God is doing a hard work here. In wrath, God is bringing about the end of our hopes and our dreams and ourselves and our works according to the law. God is removing all ungodliness from us. And that's a hard work. Because as one of my old pastor friends from uh, down in Elk Point said, uh, uh, the old creature in us dies hard. We don't like it. And so God goes about and does this foreign work, this difficult work, of removing all of our false senses of security, all of the false places we place our hope and our dreams. God is removing all hope apart from where he will have it, which is in his son, Jesus Christ. We don't like this. We'd rather talk of a God of love than a God of wrath. We'd rather look at our own works and say, look at what we've done. Look at all the blankets we tied. Isn't that surely a good work? All the blankets that will go out and warm people who need it. We like to look at those things. We like to point to him and say, surely God can't be angry with me. Look at all that I've done. But look at what happens when we do this. Where is our hope? Where is our faith? It places it in ourselves and our own works. Even if we are using God's law, God's good law to accomplish these things, it is still our work that we look to for hope, for peace. And I don't know about you, but whenever I look inside for peace, I never find it. I think internal peace uh, that you turn inward on is, is an absolute fraud. It's false. problem is we think this is the best part of us. We think that our idols and and all of our works are, are something to behold. We like to think that there is something and not a nothing. And we can look, something that we can look back on and say, look at what we have done. God can't possibly be angry with us. Not after all that. Yet the idols in our lives attest to something different as they begin to turn on us until finally they they take the place of our faith. We can put anything in, in, in our lives, we can make an idol out of anything and put our hopes and our dreams in it. We're good at this. Our hearts are a constant idol factory where we try to seek peace and comfort apart from God. Yet it doesn't work. Habakkuk stands in awe. In awe of you, God. Habakkuk stands terrified of this God. Terrified of what he sees. 
the God that stands in glory, the God whose glory covers the heavens, the God whose power brings forth the brightness of the sun, the God who makes the nations tremble and shatters the eternal mountains. How can you not stand in awe and terror before this kind of God? From verses 3 through 15, Habakkuk speaks of the glory of God. And so let's look at this. In your Bibles, we pick it up in verse 5, in verse 3. The glory, his glory covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. The brightness was like the sun, God's brightness was. Rays came forth from his hand, where his power lay hidden. Before him went pestilence. And plague followed behind. He stopped and he shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The eternal mountains themselves are shattered along with ancient pathways and everlasting hills were sunk low. Where was your wrath, O God? Against the rivers? Your rage against the sea? You brandished your naked bow, sated with the arrows at your command. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and they withered. They writhed. The moon stood still in its exalted place at the light of your arrows speeding by. In fury you trod the earth. In anger you trampled nations. you read that, you see the terror with which you see the nakedness of God, the glory of God. And so Habakkuk puts this all in his prayer until the end where he simply says, I hear and I tremble within. My lips quiver at the sound. To behold God in his glory is to feel God's wrath. It is to know deeply that you are sinful and unrighteous. And it brings terror to your conscience. The prophet is teaching fear. Fear of God. So the prophet does the only thing that he can do. He says, I listen and I tremble at the sound. And I wait quietly for the day of calamity. In wrath, God is doing a work upon Habakkuk and the people who have ears to hear. In wrath, God is doing this work on you. You see, here God is removing all of our idols so that faith in the one true God can remain. To hear of God and God's majesty makes us do one thing and one thing only, and that is to run as far from it as possible. And when we do that, then we run to the place where God wants us to run, which is the feet of those who bring the good news to the preacher. To the preacher who brings the good news of Jesus Christ as Paul spoke of it. As Paul lifts and plagiarizes that passage from Isaiah 52, he brings it into his letter to the Romans and he says, here is where the wrath of God is finally extinguished, where you can have peace with this God. Where all ungodliness is removed where there's only room for Jesus Christ. Paul knows something about God's wrath, that it must be taught so that people learn to fear God and his glory. And when we learn to fear, we do the only thing that we can do. We flee to the only place that we can find peace is the God made flesh in Jesus Christ. To behold God in God's glory is to tremble. It is to fear. It is to know that we are not righteous. That we cannot be righteous. You have not. You cannot. But you must. That's how one of my professors 
put it. In relationship to God and God's glory, you, you have not, you cannot, but you must, which leaves us in, in a place of terror. And so we run to those beautiful feet, to the feet of those who bring a word of promise, a word of hope, the word of Jesus Christ, where faith is now made, where wrath is extinguished, and in its place, Jesus Christ and his word of promise remains. I have claimed you by name, Jesus says. This is what the promise sounds like. I have called you by name. You are mine. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, and no one will snatch them from me. I lay my life down for you, my sheep, that I may pick it up again. That's where we run to. That's where we find hope. That's where we find peace through God's word of promise. We don't find it turning in on ourselves. We don't find it worshiping idols, whatever it might be. It might give us a glimpse or a moment of peace, but it doesn't give us true peace. The place where we find that, the only place we find that is in Jesus Christ and his word for you. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am your God. And because I'm your God, I lay my life down for you that you may have salvation, that you may have eternal life through the forgiveness of sins, which happens here and now. And so no longer must we stand in terror as we behold the glory and majesty of this God, but we run to the manger. We run to Mary who holds her Christ child, and we see our God born in the flesh, born for us, born to forgive us our sins and to raise us to eternal life, to make us new. And so today, find peace in this word for you. Now, my feet are not beautiful, <laughs> but the words that are proclaimed, the word of promise is and God has sent me here today for that very purpose. That you would no longer live in this place of wrath and fear of God. But that you would rest comfortably now. Through the word of promise of Jesus Christ. And for that we say thanks be to God. Amen.